Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Udang Dhammang Sangang Namasami There's a sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya where the connected discourses, where the Buddha says something very simple, but it's a phrase that is echoed in my head ever since I read it. He says, when a house is on fire, the vessel salvaged is the one that will be of use. So when this life is on fire with birth, aging, and death, what is given away is well salvaged. And in a Buddhist context, what this means is when one gives, the goodness of the act, the brightness of heart from that remains and is a possession that one carries into the future and even, um, you know, in a Buddhist context between lifetimes. And I think this is a very helpful recollection at times, say, uh, you know, the Buddha outlined seven different uh, reasons to give, which are usually stated in this, in this ascending order of refinement where one gives thinking, this will come back to me in the future. The next is one gives thinking giving is good. The next is one gives thinking this person has less, less than me, all the way up to one gives thinking when I give, the mind becomes tranquil and settles easily, and uh, one gives as an ornament of the mind. And I think we all wish that we could usually just sort of dance around at those top levels of giving, but I find there's a real use for that basic recollection if you're really trying to get rid of something and having a hard time with thinking, this will come back to me. And then when you make yourself give the thing, the act of giving is so wide and beautiful that it overwhelms any selfishness in the initial motivation. And one doesn't have to believe in some sort of esoteric economy of karma and merit for this. Um, you can just see it in the life, how when you give, this sort of sense of generosity becomes known. Um, you, uh, a lightness of heart comes and people respond with in kind. When one gives, uh, that patterning and that thing given does come back. And in a sense, I think this is just significant because what it means when you think about our lives in the context of uh, a mortal span is anything not given is lost. Everything we hold on to will be ripped from us one way or the other. All that we keep is what we give away. That's all that remains with us. And this applies to the smallest things like the bag of coffee you don't want to give out or maybe the big apple that you'd like to keep for yourself and kind of give the smaller apple to a friend. Ajahn Chah used that example a lot. But it applies to a life. If life is a forum for us to seek comfort, praise, pleasant experience, you know, most of us have seen past the Camaro but even the sense of sort of, you know, experiences traveling or uh, even experiences going outdoors, um, things like this, we do accumulate. And life can have that selfish edge in so many ways and that flavor of craving, even with regards to the practice, is the practice for us. And a life lived with that flavor and that, polarization of feeding, of for me, is a life 
lost. The only life, the only thing life we get to keep is the one we give away. And this death recollection meditation we all partook of at the beginning of this session, um, that was my, uh, Long Por Anand, my ordaining teacher. He ordained with Ajahn Chah, and he just couldn't stay with the breath. So for the first four years of his practice, death recollection was his main object. Um, specifically the phrase, life is uncertain, death is certain. And it has to be used sparingly. If you start to get depressed, that's not a good sign. But it's a very useful tool in terms of cutting off thinking with thinking and hamstringing the uh, proliferative, proliferative mind. The, there's a f famous scene in the suttas where the Buddha, um, and this is the only context in the suttas where the Buddha speaks about the present moment, is in the context of death contemplation. He says, bhikkhus, how often do you contemplate death? And of course, one bhikkhu says, you know, every seven days, I think how lucky I am to have these seven days to practice the Dhamma. And he says, you are heedless. And then the next bhikkhu says, okay, you know, every day I think about it. And he says, you also are heedless. And so on until one says, just as long as I take to swallow a uh, mouthful of food and think how lucky I am to have this long to practice the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha says, you are heedless. <laughs> And then the next bhikkhu says, just as long as it takes to have one in-breath, I think how grateful I am to have this long to practice the teachings. And just lo as long as I have this out-breath. And the Buddha says, you are heedful. You are practicing correctly. It reminds me of the story of, uh, there was a bunch of novices at Nana Chat, and uh, you could see down the line, like one sort of poured themselves a big glass of Ovaltine, and then the next one had like poured himself a little bit less to just sort of show up the next monk, and you sort of sort of this line of like decreasing amounts of Ovaltine. But I think in this case, you know, the, the final monk really had it uh, correct. Because we take for granted the length of this life and we are careless. And this recollection of death is not a uh, morbid one. It's what allows us to see what is trivial and non-trivial. And it's what allows us to step from that place of wanting to accumulate to knowing that we have this long to give and just this long. And what else is worthy of our deaths? Part of why I wanted to talk about that was um, in the context of the hindrance of doubt. And we are pretty good at identifying the other hindrances. For, so for those who don't know, those are the five blocks to meditative calm. You have sensual desire, kama, chanda, um, thinking about the pizza, the piece of chocolate, the Netflix, whatever it is. Um, it's not that uh, sensual pleasures are inherently bad. It's that our attachment to them and how you can proliferate about an experience uh, for days and then it happens and it's all of five minutes. I think if anyone's been on retreat or meditated like you just did, then you've had this experience. The second hindrance is vayapada or uh, aversion, hatred. Um, how you kind of chew over the same uh, uh, aversive states, the same resentments again and again. and. I think, you know, it's interesting to notice this right when you wake up because the mind will try to crystallize immediately a self for you right when you wake up. And the easiest thing to crystallize around is that argument and that guy. Like, you know that face that comes up right away. And that's why when you wake up, it's so helpful to make yourself crystallize around metta and the path. The first thing you should do when you wake up is bow and then bring to mind loving kindness right away and keep that in mind for the first 10 minutes of your day no matter what. Uh, Ajahn Tiradhamma recommends, or Viradhamma recommends not even moving. Um, just lie there in bed for about five minutes, bring awareness to your heart and just get that glow of loving kindness going. And investing that sort of intention at the very beginning of your day and letting yourself crystallize around loving kindness will pay dividends into the whole day. The third hindrance is tinamita, uh, sloth and drowsiness, something we're all familiar with. 
The fourth is utacha kukucha, which is restlessness and remorse. Um, and as everyone has heard, the Pali word's really fun to say and very onomatopoeic. It means kind of a hovering above, utacha kukucha. The fifth hindrance is doubt, gicha gicha, which is slightly onomatopoeic as well, I find. And this isn't just doubt in the Buddhist teachings, it's the, it's the hindrance of doubt. And often we can see clearly the proliferation around pizza as a hindrance. We can see the argument as a hindrance because it hurts. As the Buddha said, anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root. But doubt we buy into. Because you can spend all of a meditation session wondering, you know, exactly which technique you should be doing right now. Or, you know, if you're interpretation of dependent origination is right on or uh, you know what you should do about this or that and it can seem like a very valid way to spend your meditation and doubt hamstrings people more than almost any of the other hindrances it's so difficult to move past so when the Buddha talked about ways to move past doubt um, one of the ways in a sutta called the Ahara Sutta, Samyutta Nikaya 4651, was he talked about one starves doubt by saying or thinking, these are states of brightness connected with good. These are states of darkness connected with what is unskillful. That's a confusing phrase. What I think it means is the Buddha is pointing to coming back to the state of mind of doubt and seeing its flavor. Because when you're in a doubting state of mind, you'll find something to chew on. And it's so easy to think that the way through doubt, the way past doubt is through doubt. And it's not. You can chew on this or that object trying to resolve it, and it never resolves. What you can do is notice the state of mind of doubting. What does it feel like? Uh, what's its attraction? Um, does it feel like it's a negative or a bright state? And this is what it means to come back to seeing bright states as bright and dark states as dark. You cease to become fixated on the object of doubt and become intent upon the act of doubting and the state of mind that doubts. And one really useful way to look at that state of mind is what the Buddha called the um, gratification triad, which is where he recommended looking at the advantage, the asada, or the attraction of a state, the drawback, uh, the um, asada, forgot the poly, sorry, and then the uh, escape, which is the nisarna. And what this means is you, most of us see the drawback of doubt. That's easy. But what the Buddha is saying here is that you can't move past the state until you understand why you keep coming back to it, why you're feeding on this state. So what's attractive? What's comforting about doubt? And a metaphor I think is really helpful for my experience of doubt is it's like being in a small closet and you know it very well. It's comforting. You can bounce around in that small closet chewing over the same bloodless bone or fleshless bone again and again. It's something to gnaw on. It's a way of orienting yourself. It's a well-traversed, dark room because it's intimidating to move into a wider expanse. We like comfort, security, habit. So notice the attraction of that, having those familiar walls that you're so used to. Ajahn Tanisaro says that the last thing you can take from people is their suffering. And I think there's a, there's a poem I know also where the poet at the end says, what immense strength it takes for... Um, who is the Greek who... Uh, the Nizan of hell who had to roll a stone up a hill again and again? Sisyphus, yes. 
what great strength it takes for Sisyphus to turn away from a stone he's been pushing for eons. The strength it takes to walk away from a great weight we've been carrying. Because crystallizing the self and knowing it, it's really, it's one of the strongest attractions of all. And that's what doubt does, is it lets you bounce around the same thinking again and again and again, trying to make the shape of yourself in it. So just seeing that, and then seeing the pain of it, and that will help you move past. There are other ways through doubt, though, too. Um, one good one is the phrase uh, WWLPPD, what would long Passana do? That's what I use a lot. I have like a little long porpoisana who kind of sometimes will float above my shoulder and just kind of like scold me for things. But it's very helpful because you know if you have that teach in your life, it doesn't have to be long porpoisana. But ask what they would say. And so often it's very clear, you know, and that puts things to rest very quickly in terms of doubt. But one of the most powerful tools is death contemplation. When you really think how long you have, that you don't know how long you have, what is worthy? And so often this clears away, it's Manjushri's sword. It just clears away all the excess and you know exactly what's worthy and worth doing. And more than that, death contemplation, if used correctly, should change the paradigm of your orientation from one of taking and wanting to one of giving. And so often doubt in an activity um, is based around this arithmetic of what's going to lead to your own happiness. And that's an arithmetic that never ends. It's a checkbook you never balance. I'm sure you've all been through this of, you know, trying to figure out if you love the person more than they love you. And there's something inherently flawed about that approach to love and to life. Because you're always in the red. The only way you feel loved is by giving love. And the only way to end doubt is by thinking in terms of what you can give, at least for me. Because there's some days where I really uh, would love to have dinner and watch a Marvel movie. And if this arithmetic of like, what's best for my life? You know, like maybe, you know, maybe there'd be, you know, I, I love being a monk, but you can chew on that forever. But when you ask yourself, what's the biggest gift, what's the greatest gift I can give in this life? For me, the answer is very clear. In meditation, often doubt uh, will come when the mind becomes refined and the mental activity drops off because all these ways of orienting ourselves around our experience, all these sort of residual mental impressions have faded and you find yourself flailing. So when you find yourself in that suddenly blank field, it's very helpful to come to a very careful, refined point. Um, often when the mind becomes that refined uh, or more refined, uh, my experience is that one can lose the breath and then to come even more close to the breath, even more narrow, um, and really ca carefully keep a finger on it as your orienting point in that disorienting place, that's where doubt can end. It's just in the meditative domain, uh, finding some clear, consistent reference point to hold to when you're not bouncing around like a pinball between this familiar landscape. Other skillful techniques I think are, uh, often I'll ask myself a question that I've been chewing on um, a lot right when I wake up. Um, but I think one of the biggest things is realizing that in the Buddhist context, everything's about intention. That's what all other uh, experiences move from. And 
what I've found as a monk stepping from a life of making brooms to one of trying to navigate uh, nonprofit board dynamics is the temptation is as the field expands to expand your gaze to and try to get all the conditions to figure everything out and it's just not possible. And the irony is that for me, as the field expands of choice, of action, ironically, you have to focus even more on your own heart and the rudder. It's as if in a calm sea, you can actually look out at the horizon. But then as the sea becomes rougher, all you get to do is make sure you're steering correctly into the next wave. And this is a uh, way to peace because you can't know all the conditions, but often you know exactly the quality and flavor of a decision in your heart. What leans towards generosity, towards simplicity, towards good enough for the practice, towards giving? That decision is often very clear. And what makes you feel strong? And often that's a bodily sense. The decision that uh, is weakening is one you feel as the body disintegrates, it weakens. And uh, this is a useful metric because when you come to those decision points in life and you kind of whinge and think, well, maybe it's fine in this case, but you know that the heart is weakened by that. You know that staying at the job in this way is weakening you, is making you feel less than you are. You know that even if things panned out okay, you would have taken the cowardly route. And you know the root of courage, of stability, of dhamma. Even if things don't resolve, you'll know you've taken the root in the heart that is conducive to the path. In Buddhism, the ends never justify the means because the means are the ends. Jaitana, intention, is the quintessential seed in every moment. And there's no real space of normalcy um, in the sense that uh, I went to a, a sermon recently and the pastor was saying, look, you know, uh, in these times of difficulty in COVID, you know, there are times of resurrection, these non-normal times. And what really came to mind for me is that there's no normal times. Either every moment is a moment of death or one of uh, resurrection. It's either a moment of giving or taking, of stepping onto the Dhammic path or stepping off of it. And you feel that flavor in your heart. And that, for me, is an ending of doubt, too. One of the most famous suttas is the Kachayana Sutta. Uh, and in it, the Buddha says, one knows just this. This is the arising of stress. This is the fading of stress. In this, one's knowledge is independent of others. It is to this extent, bhikkhus, that I declare right view. And the Buddha declared many forms of right, you know, a right view that involves the whole path. But when he condensed it down, transcendent right view is the four noble truths. And the sense of dukkha, of knowing suffering in your heart and knowing when it gets let go of, that's the key and the keel and the compass that we continually come back to. So in terms of this flavor of knowing what decision is cowardly and what is strong, what's steady, what is wavering, what is an orientation of giving versus one of feeding, Dukkha, this word, suffering, stress, it has so many implications. Ajahn Jayasara was once asked what, uh, what koans we have in Theravada, and he said, Dukkha is our koan. Understand Dukkha, and you understand everything. So in this sense, this, all those come down to that form of right view. In that moment, you know what's weak, what's suffering, what's middling. That's Dukkha. And do you know what's beyond that, the cessation of suffering, the broad, spacious, strong path? That's the cessation of dukkha. And you can know that every moment. But often to get there, 
you need to recollect the sort of transitory nature of this life and this uh, brief experience we have to come back to it. And just finally, you know, it's lovely to have that place to rest of transcendence, of uh, high wisdom, but uh, the props and the routine are important. We're creatures of habit. So one really lovely way passed out also is just uh, automating those parts of your life that you can and coming up with a habit uh, a system of rituals, of habits, of props that help hold you in the midst of doubt and help direct you so that you don't always have to be thinking about what you do when you get up. The first thing you need to do when you get up is you bow to a symbol of what is meaningful to you. You go meditate um, at this time every day. Uh, you don't have to worry about what you do on Sunday because one day a week, you take a little extra time to give to practice. Um, you don't have to worry about what you're going to do at 8 p.m. because you make a habit of as many days of the week as you can of spending that period of time in meditation and people know this about you. The props are important in the words of Longpo Pasano. And one really good way of applying that clarifying vision to a life is what we call aditana, uh, determination. And this is where you just make a strong determination to not do this or to do this. And much of our uh, path is gentle and one of steadily watching old desires and obsessions fade. Um, and you just find you're not as interested anymore in those things you were and you can just drop them. But now and again, uh, there's a place to use the sword of wisdom, and that's aditana, where you know something has gone on long enough, and you just say, I am not going to do that anymore. And if you need to make it formal, then you can tell a friend. I've mentioned this before. You can write a check to the rival politician, give it to a friend and say, like, if I have the cigarette, I will call you, and you need to mail that check. Um, but you can also just make... a uh, make that determination in front of an image, a Buddha image, bow three times and sincerely say, you know, um, whatever it is. And uh, be a little wary with these aditans. Most monks I know have gone a little too far every now and again. Uh, but, uh, you know, give yourself a test period and then just be willing now and again to make that brave act of just saying, especially with really damaging habits, like no more drinking. Um, and this is what the five precepts are for. No more killing, no more stealing, no more sexual misconduct, no lying ever. And that clear, uh, and no intoxicants. And that clarity of just cutting off that sickness of choice so that you can live a simple life, remembering that which is worthy. That's helpful. The Buddha compared that moment when you passed out to a merchant traveling through a dangerous uh, desert frequented by bandits, not knowing if they'll get through to having arrived at safety and refuge. And I wish you all that refuge. Sadhu, 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 anumodami. So we have uh, time for questions and things people would like to discuss. If you're on YouTube, you can type in questions on the chat. If you're on Zoom, we actually can see you now. So you can raise your real hand or your little emoticon hand and uh, you can actually ask the question in person. Um, so yeah, we're trying to make it a little more intimate. And if you're in person, you can also ask questions just by raising your hand or something. And just wait till the mic comes to you and then say your name and hold the mic close to your mouth.
Hi, thanks um, for the teaching. Um, I was wondering if you had any more thoughts on um, working on the attachment to intoxicants specifically or anything around that, yeah, that whole theme that you touched on. Yeah, thank you. The fifth precept is uh, one gives up intoxicants and uh, it's perhaps the most, you know, it's the most difficult one to talk about in Western audiences because on one level it's just a glass of wine, right? Um, so I'd say there's two ways uh, on one level. Um, there's two ways of talking about it. One is for people who are really struggling with a strong, strong addiction. Um, and I don't have as much personal experience with that. Um, although I think really looking at intoxicants in terms of all the things we use to distract ourselves in terms of process addiction, um, all that, you know, um, is helpful. But one thing I think can help is, uh, you know, recognizing that if we have that part of us, um, you don't really have the choice of giving up an addiction for nothing um, in the sense that it seems one of the most effective ways is to replace one process addiction with another. And um, the process addiction of Dom is a good addiction, you know, and really pouring yourself into it. So I find, you know, often people who have had strong addiction problems end up to be the most sincere practitioners I've ever met because uh, they've really seen the first noble truth and they don't accessorize. They realize this is life or death. Um, but really, you know, surrounding your, taking into consideration the Buddhist teachings on conditionality, like realizing how in some ways you're the sum of the four people you hang out with the most, or at least you can think of that, and changing those people, like, Stepping away from a life of use really requires a radical shift to who, who you spend that time with and all that. Um, I think Aditana is very helpful in that context, you know, really making these determinations. Going to monasteries and kind of taking that chance to just be in this really pure environment like you would a hospital. Um, and to have sympathy for yourself through that. And I haven't worked with strong addiction um, in that way. And... Uh, but I feel like uh, there are a lot of programs apart from AA, including Refuge Recovery, Hungry Ghosts United, which are Dharma programs aligned with that same ethic of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is, our, is such an amazing organization. Um, for those who don't have as strong of a, a draw and deep addiction, it becomes interesting to talk about because that fifth precept for me, you know, you can just justify it as a glass of wine, and it's not, you can still practice well while having some wine, you know. But I think for people who are ready to take that step with the fifth precept, and I think it's a good one to take, um, the Buddha said that it was pretty essential. Like, I think the reason it's there is first to realize that in the Buddhist worldview, this faculty of mindfulness and clarity of consciousness is unbelievably rare and sacred, and anything that compromises it, it's unworthy of us. The second is when you're a kid and your parents just say, have a glass of beer or wine, like you, you notice, you do feel it, something changes. Um, the third is that even if we can control, say, how much we take of a certain intoxicant, those around us might not be able to, and those we love. And having a reference point for young people or, nor, you know, old people in society uh, about the fact that, like, not everyone has to drink to have fun is, like, it's not an insignificant landmark to have to represent that um, in people's lives because it really might make a difference in someone who doesn't have that same self-restraint. But the biggest thing, I think, with the fifth precept is you can really negotiate that you know, it's just like, uh, it's just this much. It's just a glass of wine. But for me, that moment of 
just complete surrender. That's what that fifth precept represents. It's like, okay, I'm done bargaining. Like the Buddha said on all five, I'm just going to take all five and give it all up. And there's a real, on one level, it's a glass of wine. That shift of heart, though, from negotiating and everything to a complete ethic of surrendering, that's not a trivial shift. So, yeah, just to say if people, you know, people live as they will and it's okay, the monk isn't going to judge you, it's okay, um, practice as you will, but I think those are useful recollections. Um, and the Buddha really did uh, raise up that, those, he really advised giving up intoxicants. Yeah. Frank? Uh, and people on Zoom, raise your hands if you're interested as well. We'll go to you. So I guess you got into this a little bit, but I was wondering if you could speak more about the idea of applying the fifth precept to things beyond drugs and alcohol because like I know for me alcohol and drugs aren't particularly a pro a problem but like I'll sit on Twitter and just fume over <laughs> her stuff that has no effect on my life. I could easily just ignore or I'll end up watching a violent movie and get really into it and be really mad and the movie ends and I'm still mad and it just sort of <laughs> twists the rest of the day. Yeah. And yeah, we tried to clear mountain our, we have some publicity stewards and we had a Twitter account briefly and just Elon Musk was the only thing in our Twitter feed the whole time. So, can't really relate, but I think the, um, so Thich Nhat Hanh is uh, famous for having expanded the five precepts to include a broader swath of experience. So the admonition against intoxicants became admonition against intoxicating media. Any horror movies are out of the question. Um, and I think that's a uh, beautiful expansion. The reason it's not explicitly in the precept is because when you expand the scope of each precept, you necessarily make it less strict. Because there's like a time when you're with your parents who you haven't seen in a few years and they want to watch a movie. Um, and, you know, you, you watch a movie and that's fine. And if people watch Netflix, it's fine. It's okay. But, uh, you know. It's best to steer away from those things if you know you're feeling inclined to. But um, all to say that the five precepts are very narrow because they're things that you can do unequivocally all the time. Like to be able to say that you will never lie is such a powerful phrase because then your loved one, you know, then they can ask you like, "Did you cheat on me?" And you can say no, and it's done you know, for them to have that guarantee. So there's a reason why the five precepts are like narrow, but expanding the scope and applying the ethic to a broader scope of experience is really useful. Um, so yeah, I think uh, looking at social media, news, intoxicating uh, media in the light of that fifth precept of intoxication is really useful. Um, skillful means around that in terms of uh, finding ways to constrain the use. There's programs for that um, that kind of can cut you off from media. Um, taking seriously the, you know, long form Pasano's advice to step back a lot from news. You know, read a long form article or two every week if you need to. But um, that sort of mantra of I want to stay informed, that's unexamined. Like, what does that really mean and how necessary is it? And what difference are you really making in that realm? Um, Find one issue you can make a difference in. Often it'll be local and be very well informed about that. But then the other stuff, if it's affecting the flavor of your heart um, or the feel of your heart, then as practitioners, you have a strong responsibility to take care of your heart. Um, so I think taking that very seriously. Uh, yeah, and noticing what feels trivial. 
And there's a real place for aditana in terms of cutting off those roots towards wasting time. Yeah. Allison. Um, thank you, Alton. Could you speak toward the role, if any, of right effort within the practice of meditation, specifically within the insight meditation practice? So specifically, the four aspects of right mm. effort. Thank you. Insight meditation in terms of going to Vipassana? No. Our, our insight. <laughs> Go ahead. So the four aspects of right effort are uh, to cultivate wholesome states that or to prevent unwholesome states that are unarisen from arising, to abandon arisen unwholesome states, to uh, bring forth wholesome states that have not yet arisen, and to strengthen and cultivate arisen wholesome states. And insight practice, um, if we're looking at it as the practice of insight within the context of our meditation. Okay. One useful way to see it, I think, is when there's a strong tendency in meditation teachings to divide up samatha, tranquility meditation, and insight vipassana. When you move through say, mindfulness of breathing, you understand that these aren't really separate. There's pl a place to separate them in certain contexts, but much of the time what you do is you remain with a meditation object until you see the uh, coarseness of it because the mind gets more and more refined. So say you're with the sort of feel of the breath coming uh, in and out of the lungs, and soon you begin to feel sort of a bright, uh, light um, in your whole awareness or a sense of metta and you let go of a bit of that kind of coarse uh, feel of the breath you know coming in and out of the lungs and foreground that more subtle refined object and that's the process of insight uh, used in the service of calm you're letting go you're seeing dukkha in the sense of seeing the coarseness or suffering stress associated, and it's a very minor form of stress with a sort of coarse object of like the bodily lungs. You're letting go of that, which is the second noble truth, and you're touching into and realizing uh, peace in the form of a more refined object, which is uh, the third noble truth, and you're developing and putting your attention on that more refined object. It's like you're letting go of the lower rung of dukkha and grabbing onto a higher rung of peace. And you do that again and again, because after you've been with the light for a while, soon you start to see the coarseness of that, and you find an even more refined object that's, say, just a broad stillness. So in one sense, that actually represents the four right efforts as well. Like those coarse meditations aren't exactly unwholesome states that you're letting go of, but represents a similar movement from the coarse to the more refined. But in the sense of really finding these like deep and persistent patterns of suffering in our lives that come up, often meditation in the West is taught as this like technique, but it's so much more than that. Like this is your life skill forum and one of the most powerful things about that meditation form is there's an immediate feedback uh, for when we apply wrong effort because you'll immediately tie yourself in a knot. You'll immediately clench the breath. You'll see anger come up and push it away violently and suddenly you realize it, it's hard not to see how the violence that you're trying to get away is also infusing the effort itself and the effort. So there's this immediate feedback 
with wrong effort when you're applying it too strongly. And that just takes a long time for us to refine our touch of how we let go of negative states because often that is the real issue for moderns is approaching abandoning unwholesome states and trying to cling to wholesome states with this, you know, furrowed brow, clenched teeth. And on one level, it's just good to realize when we're doing that and take a step back. And it's just useful also to notice that learning how we over effort is a long process that we're undoing many, many years of patterning and just becoming and getting a more refined touch of effortless effort a little bit. Um, the one other thing I'd say is that often like these hindrances or these negative patterns that we're trying to give up, we keep going back to them. We keep going back to the doubt or the argument or the thought of the pizza. And one of the things that's really useful is to not look at meditation as this kind of bland object we're trying to come back to, but really cultivate it as a pleasurable, wholesome forum that is actually interesting and fun and playful. And using, getting a broad variety of techniques um, that you can use, specifically learning to utilize metta, a broad conception of mindfulness of breathing, uh, where you get to figure out how when you place your awareness in different parts of the body, you can change the whole resonance of the meditation death contemplation, like this tool belt that you can play with, makes meditation interesting and fun, and you can start to get access to pleasure. And only when you give your mind something else to feed on will it be willing to let go of these other negative things it's been feeding on. I think that's the biggest lack in Western meditation, is like people are told, just bring your mind to the breath here, or this object, and it's like, you can try to do that at, with an act of will for 30 years, but it gets tiring and it just gets like slamming your head against a wall. So the new robust breath meditation techniques like in Ajita Nisaro and others are really helpful that way. I think some forms of Goenka meditation where they really talk about this broad scope of the body might also allow it as well. Is that helpful? Okay. I think effortless effort or grace of movement is also very helpful to think about as is creating a tiered practice where like often we have a lot of intention to pour into our meditation. And if we think of practice just as sitting and trying to be there with one object, often we have so much effort stored up that we just crush the object. So what we have to do then is really create a tiered practice where if you have a lot of energy and effort, like maybe you go for a run first or, you know, go for a jog. Um, Above that would be like walking meditation and studying some suttas or chanting. And if you do that for a while, you then come to a point where you can go to these more refined levels of sitting, say bringing up metta, then sitting with just the breath. Um, but finding the correct tier of practice so that you can achieve a grace of movement and move towards those subtle levels, that seems essential. Um, because often you don't, you have to find a practice that's commensurate with what effort you have there for you. So, I think I just talked for a while. Um, did anyone on Zoom have a question just so we can test it out? Oh, people on the TV. All right. Grace, can we try? Go for it. Uh, is that, if that's Mary, I'm not sure. That is Mary. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, Mary. Hello, everybody. Hello, all my <laughs> Zoom friends. Nice to be with you. I've got an echo here. Oh. I don't know if you have one there. Okay. You hear it too online. Okay, we'll try to figure that out next time. Sorry. Okay, well, I will just make a short statement while you're doing that. I want to go back to the comment earlier about um, getting intoxicated with the news or paying, you know, how that being in the world, kind of keeping up on the news, being informed. And I agree with you. And I also see another aspect. And that is, I don't know of any place to see the worldly winds mm -hmm. and the three poisons in action 
better than the news. I mean, if we change our perspective from trying to be informed to seeing this is dukkha, we don't have to go far to see it. We can see it being played out. I think that there's a place for that to be part of practice and to really open our hearts and not to be up on every little thing, but to, I just think it's a huge compassion practice to watch the news. Thank you, Mary. When I was coming back, I arrived in the US on election night uh, in 2020. And before I came back, um, I got to talk to two teachers. Um, one was long for some and he's like, yep, the US, Sankaras rise and they fall. And then he was like, ha ha ha. <laughs> um, and you know, I mean, he grew up in Seattle. He cares about this place, but he also has that level of wisdom. Um, and then Ajahn Siri Panya said, look, you can go back, you can look at the news, but you're, you have a responsibility to not let it bring up even one negative mind state. And yeah, I think if you look at it with appropriate attention, you can. But that level, that balance between samatha, tranquility, and insight, um, it's just a balance we have to find. So in terms of like seclusion from the news and keeping your center um, versus stepping into that realm and being able to see it with wisdom towards compassion and, uh, dis and disenchantment, Ajahn Amaro compares it to sharpening a knife. Like if you're always alone and never stepping into the world or never looking at these things, it's like the knife angle that you're sharpening against the whetstone is very shallow and it just remains dull. But the issue is if you don't get enough time alone and you're always out there and you lose mindfulness, and a good test of this is if you are feeling that burn in your heart, if you're losing mindfulness of your body, not just with the news but with interaction with people in general, that's like the knife is too steep of an angle and the edge breaks. So finding that correct level for all of us is really, really good. And I think that's a really good point, Mary. There's also a website called coronavirus.org. That's all the good news. It's like, a, I think they had like a headline, like man adopts 20 puppies and uh, <laughs> things like that. So that's bookmarked for me, or it was. <laughs>